webinar entitled uh, Water Heating Demand Response Opportunities and Gas and Electric Water Heaters. Uh, like the title says, we're going to be discussing uh, opportunities for including water heaters in demand side management, both demand response and energy efficiency programs. My name is Matt Carlson and I'll be your moderator today. Today, uh, Before we, we begin though, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, first of all, this may be a new platform for you all, so I'd uh, encourage you to take the time to kind of look around at the uh, different control options, but your screen is uh, customizable. So feel free to make uh, various windows as large or small as you'd like. We can even minimize them to drop to the menu at the bottom of your screen. Uh, presentations can be downloaded as PDFs from the resource list on the menu. So just be aware of that. Um, all attendees are in listen-only mode, but can submit questions through the Q&A box at any time during the webcast. The presenters will respond to questions throughout and at the end of the presentations. And I'm gonna actually um, compile all the questions and then uh, at the end of a <clears throat> at the end of the session and we'll we'll come back to them later uh, the Q&A uh, feature can be accessed at the bottom of the menu of your screen if you haven't uh, if it's not already visible uh, all presentations will be available uh, for on-demand viewing within a few days of the engagement hub so I'm going to give you a frowny face the first person that asked the question in the chat window hey will the presentations be downloadable because the answer is yes so, and at the end of the session, we'll be opening uh, chat rooms on the Zoom platform for anyone who wishes to continue the conversation regarding the session or ask further questions of the presenters. So please do stick around for the entire session and at the end because these Zoom sessions, I think is a neat opportunity for a little one-on-one -on -one interaction. Uh, to access the Zoom chat, there's a chat room icon in your menu bar uh, with the link. And additionally, and lastly, uh, I wanted to put in a shameless plug for the commerce session um, that uh, will be hosted by the ACEEE here at 3.30 Eastern time. They're calling it a happy hour. So that's a early happy hour, but uh, I would encourage you to come. Those of you who have been the ACEEE forum in the past know that this is a, an opportunity for companies to present a short infomercial on their latest and greatest, and the audience uh, uh, who is participating will judge the best pitch. So I encourage you guys to uh, participate in that. Uh, then lastly, before we get going, and on behalf of, of uh, ACEEE, we first want to recognize and thank our sponsors for this event. So Reem, uh, A.O. Smith, Jackson EMC, NIA, Bradford White, so, and SoCal Gas. So thank you all for um, your sponsorship and participation in this session. Uh, without then further ado, I will actually forward the slides here, which hopefully you're seeing. There we go, and we're getting to, and uh, Semper Energy, yes, so SoCal Gas being the Semper sub. Um, I'm going to start off with our first presenters then. Uh, we have Jessica Atwater, who is a program uh, manager at Clear Result and leads the team for the award-winning uh, Pacific uh, Portland General Electric uh, Connected Water Heater Program. And also joining us is Rebecca Brisson, who's the product manager for demand response at PGE and the responsible party for the uh, PGE Connected Water Heater Program. So uh, without any further ado, I'll hand it off to uh, Jessica and Rebecca to take it from here. Thanks, Matt. Rebecca, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you guys hear me? We can. All right, that's good news. Uh, lots of troubleshooting this morning. So good morning, everybody, or afternoon. So it depends on where everybody is. Um, I'd like to give you guys a little background uh, as we kind of jump into the, the water heater as a peak pricing tool. So as PGE as a whole, um, we were challenged um, with achieving an overall 77 megawatt goal um, by 2020, which is now-ish, or about the end of this year. Um, for water heaters in general, um, we were tasked with providing five megawatts of that power back to the energy back to uh, the grid. Uh, but we feel like there's a total uh, achievable potential of 25 megawatts. So we are getting uh, pretty close to getting there. Um, COVID has obviously thrown a, a wrench in our plans, as did everybody, uh, for stopping installs and um, whatnot. Uh, but we will take you through kind of what that looks like for us. Um, so, 
We have um, two switches out in the field, um, both through Wi-Fi connection as well as a cell-enabled uh, connection. Um, we're finding um, both have their kind of you know pluses and minuses as we go through um, what those look like, and um, we are finding that for, for various reasons, um, cell seems to be having a little bit more um, connectivity, um, but we're getting we're getting a little bit more kind of productivity through some of our Wi-Fi. So um, all of those connect through cell tower. And then we use the Mbala um, concerto uh, platform to control everything. So uh, we can talk back and forth and let they turn those switches on and off, and then they talk back to us and tell us, um, you know, uh, the energy that was that was shifted. Um, so I'm going to jump it over to Jessica. She's got a fun little question for everybody. Jessica. Yeah, so we have a fleet size of 8,422 water heaters. So I'm curious, how many properties do you think participate in our program with that many water heaters? Guys, respond here. And this is, so, yeah, just within PGE territory. All right, I think that's enough time. Ah, so you, lots of folks thought maybe 101 or 84. It is actually only 62. So we have the average about 120 uh, per property. So that is on purpose. Uh, we try to, we have a minimum in the program of having at least 50 apartments per property. Um, we try to go for over 100 if we can, um, it to help with cost effectiveness and being efficient with our time and resources. So one of those things that Justin said was about being kind of efficient, and I, I skipped this over a little bit in the, in the overview, but as we kind of go through all of those uh, water heaters, um, we're kind of looking at bringing back those that, that energy, right? So kind of shifting that. Um, so right now for summer and how we call events, um, is we call events every, let me back up. One of the great things about this particular program um, is that they have little restrictions on how uh, we can call them, when we can call them, how long we can call them, et cetera, um, as well as um, how we notify our customers. Um, being that in each of those switches that I mentioned earlier, we have kind of a fail-safe mechanism um, which if it's, if it's in an event and we call a uh, we call an event and the customers come home and they decide to do a whole bunch of stuff, dishwashers, washing machines, et cetera, um, the switch would be smart enough to get them out of the event and start reheating the water. So therefore, we can call an event every day, uh, weekday, that's not a holiday, and not an event longer than eight hours. So for the summer right now, we're calling one event a day, um, from about either 4 to 8 or 5 to 9. But in the winter, we call two events a day from about 6 to 9 and 5 to 8. So there's tons of flexibility um, in this program, which is really great. Um, and as Jessica alluded to, across those uh, 64 um, properties, um, we have just under about 9,000 finally connected water heaters. Um, like I mentioned earlier, COVID has uh, paused us for about three or four months um, with doing any installs, but we have um, over 10,000 contracts. So we're just uh, just now starting to get back to the field. So we should be uh, easily hitting our megawatt goal um, as we continue to do that in tweet. So. Exactly. All right, yes, yes. Sure. Yes, this is, this is what all those water heaters look like uh, when you're going to get them into an event. So this is Mbala's Concerto platform. So it's a virtual power plant and assets, the water heaters can be associated to different groups of virtual power plants. The example you see here is every single water heater in our fleet actively heating uh, on the morning of July 16th. So just to orient yourself in this platform, you see the zero, that's if there was no heating happening. If you were to go above zero, 
that would be you had a battery of some kind of absorbing energy onto the grid. And when you're below zero, that's actually use the water heater is using power. So I always have to remind my brain <laughs> to do that flip. Uh, so this is what it looks like when the water heaters are actively heating. You see a lot of up and down, a lot of movement, um, and definitely below zero. So this is what an event looks like. This is our all call event. So we started calling, um, all call events this summer, typically evaluation dictated that we needed to switch on and off between an A group and a B group each week uh, in order to have an ongoing control group uh, to evaluate the performance of the water heaters. But one day a week this summer, we call the entire fleet to start testing how that's working. So you can see this orange rectangle here is the event uh, that Rebecca called. And it started at 4 p.m. And so you can see there's a little wiggle as everything moves up to zero and we get a really flat line until 8 p.m. when the event uh, ended. And then you get that real strong snapback <laughs> right at the end of the event that tells you it was working. There's a little bit of wiggle in the event lines you can see there. And that's that override feature Rebecca was talking about. So each of our vendors, uh, a Quanta and a Presidi code, have different mechanisms uh, to safeguard against cold water events. Um, they do that pretty differently, but those wiggles are each, is our devices basically saying, okay, this, this user is at risk of running out of hot water, come back and reheat. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what it looks like to have a demand response event for our program. And I will pass it back to you, Rebecca. That's great, Jessica. Yeah, thank you. So some of the key highlights, um, our first, uh, we've done this now for three seasons. Uh, we started winter of um, 18, 19, then summer, and then uh, now we're we're in the winter 1920, and now, like I said, we're in the middle of summer, but we don't have a result yet because we're in the middle of it. But throughout those three seasons, we've done a ton of work. Um, we've had two vendors have consistently adjusted connectivity and uh, control a logarithm, which has been actually kind of fun um, playing with those and figuring out, you know, where the threshold is for um, keeping customer complaints low um, and then productivity high. Um, we have gone from uh, low 60s connectivity up to as much as uh, 91, 90, 92%. So um, a lot of that playing around with um making sure the Wi-Fi is all connected um, as we install uh, Wi-Fi. So that was one thing kind of we, we skipped over in the beginning. But um, we're in multifamily um, dwellings. We at CG are actually installing Wi-Fi uh, routers and repeaters um, and then making those, a, you know, kind of a, um, uh, a naked IP, I guess, so nobody can see them. Um, nobody can, you know, tap into it and start using it to, download Netflix or anything like that. It is uh, specifically just for, uh, for water heaters, and uh, they kind of are invisible to the public. Uh, but we've gone through maintaining that and, and back and forth with maintenance. Um, getting back to the playing with a lot of residents and uh, controlling, we've had very low customer complaints. Um, as you can see there, it's less than 1%. Um, across three seasons, and we were kind of playing around with the math of, like, what does that look like when you talk about, um, you know, uh, tenants participating in the number of events we call and how many times. It, it's upwards of, like, 2 million touches um, of all these various things, and we've only had less than 1% um, uh, complaint rate. So this, that's huge. Um, you know, hats off to the whole program, hats off to our vendors um, for making this really, really uh, smooth. Um, the other thing that we see is as, as we um, go through signing all of our, our units, um, Jessica mentioned earlier that we had uh, 64 participating properties, but one of the other uh, great kind of facts with that is actually we only have 24 uh, participating property management companies. Um, so we're getting a lot of repeat business. Um, and a lot of happy customers. So we feel really good about that. Um, we only have a couple of companies that actually only have one uh, one unit in the program. 
some of them only have one unit because they literally only own one unit. And some of them um, are like, all right, I'll give you guys this one a test. And they come back and they've signed three or four or five. I think our biggest one has uh, 11 properties, I think. Just to correct me if I'm wrong, if you know that off the top of your head. But okay. um, yeah, so that's, that's great news. Um, we're, we're really happy with it. Um, yeah. So getting, getting into some of the challenges with that um, is the... Uh, Rebecca, I think we're running out of time. Okay. So maybe just run through them real quick and we can yeah. talk more about it in the uh, chat room after. Totally fine. Yeah, I'm looking at the time right now. Um, just some of our challenges were just uh, just that 12 recruitment um, and kind of the, like we spoke about for Wi Fi connectivity and we're working through, continue to work through cost effectiveness. Um, and then we'll jump on to solutions and scaling. So obviously it's just kind of being uh, right place, right time. Um, working through um, about complexities of attaching to to uh, the API and to Invala and those types of things, um, as well as um, selecting kind of our just the, the standard eight to ten weeks of vetting process. So some of that we're really trying to speed up. Um, as we're wrapping up here, Jessica, anything uh, you want to make sure to, to touch on that I missed? No, I think, I mean, yeah, everything you said, it's a lot of learning about like how to reach out to property managers in the right way, vetting the, uh, standardizing the product vetting process with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a great medium if you don't have routers that are causing entropy all the time. <laughs> There's, we have almost 900 routers that can do anything they want at any moment. So uh, focusing on that direct to device network. And then, like I mentioned earlier, yeah, just um, trying to focus on bigger buildings and streamlining processes to do as much as we can for cost effectiveness. So yeah, thanks all for right. having us, everyone. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you all for that that great presentation. And we'll definitely come back. We've got a couple of questions uh, here that we'll get to um, at the end of the session. So uh, thank you, Rebecca and Jessica. Um, so moving on, um, our next presenter is Olin Lagon, who is the CTO of Shifted Energy. He is a Hawaii native, but also a serial entrepreneur. So without further ado, Olin, I'll hand it over to you. And uh, just let me know when you need me to move the slides. All right. Aloha, everybody, and good early, early morning. So the chickens are up here, so you'll hear them in the background. So apologize for that. The wallabies don't make any sounds, though. All right, so next slide. And I can't see the slide, so I have to go back and look at my phone here. But I want to just give you guys a quick update. So Shifted Energy, we have deployed a bunch of water heaters around the world, so in, in Europe and in Asia. And so I'm just going to share with you guys a snapshot of some of the deployed services. And I'm not going to get into too much technical detail, so I'll, I'll leave that for the chat if you guys want any specific detail. The bulk of our fleet is on cellular, various networks of cellular and mesh. So uh, like Jessica was, was saying, you know, we, we have um, a bunch of heaters that are on mesh and cellular. So the utility cloud services, let me focus on that first too. The, the traditional peak load reduction we, we're doing, we're also doing some economic load shifting. And some of these are signal based. So if there's a signal coming from our utility partner, then we'll shift uh, loads accordingly. Uh, we're doing some energy storage. So um, a lot of energy storage actually. So in the middle of the day when there's excess solar, for example, we can uh, preheat water for use later by our customers. And then um, our, our latest on the utility cloud is on non-wires alternatives. So we can target certain segments of the grid, and then we can focus our, our demand response based on what's going on with uh, the local conditions there. So next slide, Matt. We also offer some local services. When I say local, these are not cloud connected. So the controllers themselves can take care of these solutions um, and do not need any type of internet connection or connectivity for that. And so one is a set point under frequency response. So we can look at if the frequency changes to a certain set point, we can trigger a, a whole, whole, whole fleet shutdown, a sub-second shutdown. We can also do a rate of change, voltage or frequency response shutdown. And uh, the, the last is on the permanent load shifting. So we can get the time locally and just do a permanent 5 to 9 p.m., for example, local shutdown. So next slide, Matt. So see, these are some of the other public value that we've monetized. And so one is reaching renters at scale. We've got thousands of renters. And so that's a really great way to, to reach renters in your program. There's a lot of the renters have electric resistance water heaters. 
including harder reach customers, so um, folks that are traditionally not served by utility programs or energy efficiency programs. We've also paired the programs with energy efficiency programs to reduce costs. So while we're there installing, we can wrap a water heater or install, um, um, change out the incandescent lights and things like that. And uh, of course, getting access to data. The next slide, Matt. So shifting to the customer, the customer also gets a bunch of uh, value adds. So we can't run demand response for some customers, um, utility customers, all the time. So when there's a seasonal shift away from DR for the utility, we can move the services to the, the customer. So we can do some time of use shifting for economic gain for the customer. Uh, some customers have solar plus storage, so we can uh, we can work with their inverter so that we can use their water heater as a battery. So we can um, fill that battery up, that water heater up in the middle of the day. Uh, some customers are on demand charges, so we can work with peak KW reduction. So we can do a peak management uh, reduction with their water heater. And we also have an eco mode, so we can squeeze out some energy efficiency for customers as well. Next slide, Matt. Uh, on the cloud services for the customers, we also have some leak detection and maintenance alerts. So we can detect some leaks and some maintenance issues and get them an alert before it becomes a bigger problem. Uh, for property managers, we can connect to systems like a property management system, and we can just shut down the heater between renters and, of course, access to secure data. So last slide, Matt. So that's my, my quick preview. And so again, these are all just services already deployed. So I'm happy to go into detail about any of them. We work with heaters as small as uh, 18 gallons in Europe to as large as 120 gallons in the continental US. So there's a, a wide range of heaters. We have heat pumps in the fleet. And so we've got a lot of experience with that. So thank you everyone. Matt, turning it back to you. Yes, sorry, I needed to unmute. So, Olin, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, that was great, and I'm sure we'll have some questions here at the uh, at the end of the discussion. Um, so, next up, we have, and let's get this slide up here. We got Ken Latal, who is the senior manager uh, at ICF, and he has over 38 years of experience in the energy efficiency uh, world, and is uh, currently running Con Edison's smart gas water heater pilot. And that is what he's going to be talking about right now. So, Ken, fire away. And I assume you'll be moving the slides, but yes. me too, I will as well. Yes. yes, I'll go ahead and move them along. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, whatever it is for you there. I appreciate everybody joining today. Um, wanted to talk about the gas water heating pilot that we're operating in Con Edison's territory. So we're much farther earlier in the process than the previous speakers. And they've been talking about electric and we've been talking about gas. And so some of the questions that came up are things like, why are we talking about gas and launching a pilot for gas? And this falls under the Con Edison's non-pipe solutions group. And they're looking for ways to be able to free up gas supply when the demand is needed for heating uh, as, instead of just water heating and look at other possibilities uh, to be able to use that technology. And so we've been going through and doing both a demand response and an energy efficiency view on this. No one at this point has really tested gas as far as demand response for um, hot water heating. So this is kind of new and we're working through a lot of evaluation and those kind of reports will be available early next year as far as uh, both demand response and energy efficiency. But we'll get into some of the details here today. And as I mentioned, we are also looking at how this not only plays into the demand response side, but also into the energy efficiency portfolio and how that would affect uh, reduction in energy use for gas. So what were the objectives of the pilot? Obviously, this is focused on natural gas for water heating. and It's a retrofit control pilot. So all of the water heaters are already installed. Uh, and we've been reaching out to individuals in Westchester County in New York State uh, to be able to participate in the program. And they've been putting in these controls as an addition 
to the control that is already a part of the water heater. And so what are the objectives? First, we're trying to actually evaluate what the natural gas savings would be in terms of therms uh, and how that actually is gonna work potentially with the quanta smart, smart water heater controls. So as I mentioned, this is something that's still relatively new. Nobody's really done a study like this. So we're working through those details to determine how we might be able to scale this up later for a much larger program. We're also trying to determine what the effectiveness is reducing gas during specific hours. And we'll get into some of the details of the demand response events, but we did do some demand response events earlier this year. Cost effectiveness, trying to determine how cost effective the overall Aquanta is as a demand side management measure and how we can deploy that as a larger scale program. We've been discussing that with Con Edison as we've been going through the last year. So, the pilot itself has been functioning since uh, January of 2019, and we do started doing some installations in May of 2019, and we've been uh, working with it since then. Uh, we're also trying to determine what the, both the customer and the contractor experience has been. Uh, for those of you that know the unit, this could be a do-it-yourself kind of installation. We did this as we had specific contractors going out and doing the installations in the various different homes. So the customer experience we're trying to identify under research, there was a survey that we did, uh, Con Ed actually did in the fall of 2019 to get some input with the people that had installations already. And the results were pretty good. And we'll get into those specifics in a minute. And then gas efficiency, what do we actually see in terms of therm reduction for overall energy efficiency? Those are all being evaluated and part of the evaluation process, which is gonna go through the rest of this year. And so they'll be having a report available next year. And we're trying to determine if there's a particular point at, in the daytime that we could actually focus on for reducing peak demand. And we actually ran the demand response events as a 24 hour period. Uh, so that kind of gave us some data to work with. So we targeted 300 customers in, well, we targeted a lot more than 300 customers. We targeted for installations, 300 controllers in Westchester County in New York, which is just north of the New York City area. Uh, as I said earlier, the timing was December 2018. We actually got started in January of 2019. Um, technically, the pilot was running is running through September 2020. The evaluation is going to continue beyond that. And we began doing installations in May of 2019. We initially had some pretty quick kickoff. Uh, we, the recruitment went pretty well. We had about 100 to 120 devices installed within like the first three months of the pilot. And then recruitment kind of slowed down and we just kind of chugged along as far as getting additional installations into the, into the various different homes. And these are all single family homes. So what we've been learning so far when we did the results, the survey last year, last October, the survey results were actually pretty positive. Out of the 120 or so customers that had installations, we had quite a few actually respond and, and we'll go into the specific numbers in a second here. The customer engagement, we did have some challenges as far as actually getting the installations into the home. One of the things that's required for the gas water heater is this must be connected to an electronic control valve on the hot water heater. And so we really had to check with the customers first. We actually had to have them send us a, a photo of their particular water heater controller that was already there to make sure that, that it was compatible with the Aquanta unit. Um, otherwise, we were gonna send people out to do an installation and not be able to finish the job. So that was something that we learned through the process that we definitely needed to make sure we were incorporating into the enrollment process. They do intend to provide a second survey towards the end of this year. It said summer 2020, but that's gotten pushed back a little bit as we're doing a little bit more evaluation. And so we'll have some survey about how folks have been working with the unit for over a year at this point. So where are we today? There's about 210 controllers that have been installed. If you remember, we said that we were trying to install 300. Um, now that we've come out of the um, COVID pandemic situation and can get back into the homes in New York State, 
then we're going to start to try and get some additional installations completed and get closer to that 300. So the overall segment for analysis has been pretty tight, uh, but we've been able to get some good data from those we've had installed. As I mentioned, the survey that was done last year, the customer satisfaction was really high. 93% of the customers were very satisfied with the program at that time. Uh, they had good things to say about the contractors who were doing the installations. And we actually had a 79 response rate. For, so those 79% response rate. So for those of you that have actually done surveys yourself in the past, a 79% response rate is pretty phenomenal. So we were pretty happy about the results at that particular time. So the current status of the program is we are going through both measurement and evaluation. We did connect, conduct six demand response events at the beginning of this year between January and March of 2020, um, used as many of the participants as we could at that particular time. And we kind of offset them so that you know, we had a control group as well as a participating group uh, to uh, identify what it was like without any demand response compared to what the effects were of the demand response. So far, the data that we've gotten back has been pretty good. It looks like the demand response has actually reduced demand for those participating hot water heaters by about 50%. Con Edison is still going through some evaluation and some uh, benefit cost analysis, and they'll be reporting some more information next year. And simultaneously, they're also still doing an evaluation of the energy efficiency. They're monitoring all the data that's coming in and looking at that evaluation and so be doing that pretty much through the end of the year and put the results together in a report for next year. And that's what I have for my details in our program. And so I'll turn it back to you, Matt. And I got the mute button. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Ken, and thank you for that review. Well, uh, seems like we do have time to get to a number of your all's questions, and we've had a number come in here. So um, I will uh, get to them, and I have a few questions on my own. Um, question for the PGE team, so Jessica and Rebecca. Um, so can you just talk a little bit more about the issue of wireless connectivity and um, is their, their, their backhaul and who, who pays the cost, uh, et cetera? And, sure. You know, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, in the case of the Aquanta devices, we're using the Wi-Fi version. And so our team installs a cell backhaul uh, router to serve Wi-Fi to those devices. And as I alluded to earlier, that's a lot of routers <laughs> for almost 5,000 devices. Uh, so that can be a little tricky to manage. Uh, and then in terms of cost, the program covers the cost of that uh, Internet of Things cellular data plan that feeds a uh, network to the routers that then serve Wi-Fi to the devices. And in the case of the Apricity R devices, those each have a SIM card. They connect directly to a Category M1 uh, cell network, which is a newer bandwidth that does machine-to-machine -machine communication and is a lower cost than traditional uh, cellular. And in that case, uh, the program also covers those costs. So there's no cost to the building owner uh, or the resident. And we certainly don't want to use resident Wi-Fi. I can't imagine uh, a way to make anyone grumpier than taking cutting into their Netflix bandwidth, particularly now during the pandemic. Uh, but also because residency turns over, um, it's not reliable enough that you, you know, you don't want to have to rely on 5,000 different people remembering to hook up their device to the network that they may or may not pay for. Not everybody buys internet. So for reliability, uh, we provide the networks and uh, the program comes to the cost. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> you know, just since we're on the topic here, um, uh, one of the folks asked a question about um, just the, the goals, the uh, uh, megawatt mm -hmm. goals and is 25 megawatts achievable and 77 megawatts in 2020? Is that coming from the rest coming from single family or is this all multifamily? 
And I guess just more generally, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll have, ask uh, Olin to follow up on this too, because I believe that Olin, you and shifted, I'll Jessica and Rebecca, maybe you could touch on this first, is what have you seen as the key selling points and, and also the concerns in um, uh, marketing these programs to multifamily owners and operators? So the question is, is two part, Riz. One is just like, hey, how achieve all these goals just based on um, leveraging multifamily only? And then secondly, um, kind of challenges and uh, but also the, the kind of the selling points anyway that you've seen them resonating for the multifamily operators. Sure. So, Rebecca, you are, I think the, the school questions are very PGE yeah. overall goal oriented. Yeah, I can jump in for that one. So, great question about the, the overall goal. So, <clears throat> the, we have multiple DR programs. Uh, so, water heaters is just um, tackling that 25 megawatt. Uh, we also have um, thermostats that are kicking some in, uh, electrification. We have business partner uh, programs. Um, so all of these combined um, will add up to that 77. So water heater specifically for multifamily is only um, tasked with that uh, eventual 25 um, uh, goal. I think uh, that's so Rebecca, your, your answer, you broke up a little bit. So maybe, Jessica, you can just uh, expand on that and then talk about marketing to the uh, uh, to that that community. Sure. So to summarize what Rebecca said, uh, the multifamily uh, water heating demand response makes up a small portion of that overall goal. A lot of PGE's megawatts are being made up uh, from different DR programs and the commercial industrial sector, single family sector, so a whole combination in the portfolio. Um, and in terms of selling this program to property management companies, it's, it's really interesting. So some folks uh, we engage with, um, there's an account manager on our team who uh, had a couple of account managers who do an amazing job, you know, getting out to in-person events um, with partners like Multifamily Northwest. So having that in-person connection and then building that over time with, you know, email, phone meetings, um, no in-person meetings right now, but previously. Um, and so some folks learn about the program and immediately say, oh, hey, I can get a $20 incentive per participating water heater per year. And my residents can get, um, it's called a Chinook book, which is a digital coupon subscription. And I say, great, sign me up, let's do this. And the whole uh, participation like sign up process is maybe a month or two months for them at most. Uh, there's of course contracts and legal reviews, so that can take time. But other folks, it's taken over a year for them to get into the program, and I think that has to do with each property management company has a pretty different setup. So there's a lot of folks. There's someone on the ground at the property. There's someone in the regional office who maybe has a few properties in their portfolio. There's someone above them who has the whole state. There's someone above them who has like the whole West Coast. So there are a lot of decision makers. I think the key to getting them comfortable and getting on board if they're having to explain this is explaining like this is helping everyone through PGE's goals to create a you know greener energy mix and you get an incentive and it's going to be great and we're hoping to provide additional value um, by providing maintenance alerts and things like that we're still working through that um, but a lot of the time their questions are like are you sure people aren't going to get cold water calls like are you sure this isn't going to damage my property in any way? And so just being able to reassure them that this is, you know, everything's UL listed. <laughs> we have safeguards for cold water. We have electricians who can come out to make things are sure, make sure things are okay uh, if, if something does happen, if someone does have a complaint. So just being able to show them all the structures we have in place in order to respond if there is a problem, but we're confident that this technology is going to work and it's going to be a win-win. Anything you want to add, yeah, Rebecca? Pretty, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that was great. Nope, that's great, Jessica. Hopefully I'm not cutting out anymore. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, we got you there, uh, Rebecca. Thanks. No, I, I think it's telling that that uh, just now, you know, a year and a half into it, um, that you were having uh, repeat, repeat customers, right? So, uh, and uh, presumably that's feeding into the recruitment of going forward and scaling the program. 
Yes, definitely. We yes, like definitely. to build on that momentum. Statement in the form of a question, but yeah, uh, indeed. Well, uh, Olin, um, I believe that you guys uh, are also uh, working with multifamily uh, operators in Hawaii. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And we are using what Jessica mentioned, the CAT M1, the narrow band. Just a, a quick note there is that in urban areas, that bandwidth is perfect. But in rural areas, we're still struggling a, a little bit with the narrow band. So how we do it with our property managers in Hawaii, we have a 2.5 megawatt contract. And we were oversubscribed with the interested property managers. And we always lead with uh, the, the primary value is that we're moving to 100% renewable. And this is a way we all can do our part. So that's the first thing we bring. So that way, you know, we feel like this is a partnership and and you're you're coming in and, and doing some some work with us. And then we'll add the other benefits. You know, there's a rebate for the customers or monthly credits. Uh, there's leak detection and maintenance alerts and things like that. But the the lead is really based on us doing our part. When we did a survey, also customers wanted that too. We surveyed uh, 1,500 people in Hawaii. And we gave them an option, a one-time credit, a monthly bill credit, or just knowing that their participation helped increase renewable penetration. And something like 90% of the people chose that renewable penetration. So it was even significant on the customer side. And so, yeah, we um, like customers, like property managers, because you get one property manager and you can get you know a couple of thousand units right there. And it, it's very helpful with uh, dealing with a single point and also property managers have maintenance staff so we can train them as well we provide some value there so that way there's some scale with them and some value with them as well too you know thanks matt great yeah great thank you um so ken a couple of questions for you about uh the water heater pilot there so uh uh first one real quick um is the program still open and can people sign up and if so how because i believe there's a website for that purpose Yes. Um, so somebody actually had asked that question. I did actually send them the link. If you all would okay. like, I can, I don't know whether it makes sense to share it in the entire chat box, but if you know folks in Westchester County, we are still accepting enrollments. You saw the numbers. We're still trying to get another 90 installations if we can. So um, yeah. we can definitely push that out to folks. So we do, do have folks yeah. interested. And, and I think another question about about this um, the project, which I think is a really interesting one for water heater programs more generally, is that clearly um, water heaters and water heating um, have a high degree of seasonality, just like thermostats do. And that water heating, uh, typically, maybe not less so in Hawaii, but um, around most of uh, North America, uh, it's a winter peaking load. Um, so I'd be curious, um, you know, how is ICF and Con Ed thinking about uh, winter versus summer? And is this program um, kind of designed around a specific season? And, and, and how is uh, kind of water heater control um, kind of aligned around that? Okay, so for the demand response, we've really been focused on the, the winter months. Since this is a natural gas unit that we're focusing on, we're really looking at trying to free up the demand for heating, uh, space heating as opposed to water heating. Um, so we've been really focused on the winter months as far as that goes. There's also the possibility that we're going to do some more demand response events in the upcoming winter season. I don't think there's any need or desire at this point to try and do that in the summer months for natural gas. As far as overall energy efficiency, they're definitely looking at the numbers throughout the year. So that's part of the reason for not having a report ready at this point, because we're um, They've been looking at the data since we kind of reached crit critical mass late last fall, and they want to try and take that through an entire year's worth of data so they can see winter, fall, spring, summer, and see how the energy efficiency reduction is across all four seasons. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see, so Ken, I'm gonna stay with you, but this is actually gonna be a question that I'm gonna ask for all of our um, Panelists here, which is um, in the, um, you know, one of the, the the challenges generally around programs is is getting to scale, right? So we're talking about pilots right now. You know that the the Con Ed program was is focused on 300 um, homes and and kind of stuck at 200 plus. I'd be curious, um, you know, that this program in particular uses uh, your trade ally network. So. 
And that is, if you think about water heaters and water heating more generally, right? vast majority of water heaters in the U.S. are sold via trades. And so I'd be curious to get our panelists' perspective on well, what are the opportunity challenges that we see in leveraging the kind of trade ally and contractor network to expand or to enable program expansion. So Ken, maybe you want to touch on that first about your experience here with this program and, and maybe just more general thoughts because you have uh, many decades of experience in working with trade ally networks in uh, deploying EE and DR programs. So maybe you can touch right. on that and then we'll go to uh, right. the PG folks and then, then uh, Owen. Okay, so the pilot itself wasn't an incentive program. We, we weren't providing an incentive to the customers to participate. We're actually providing the unit to them, providing the installation to them at no cost. So I think what, the first thing, if we were scaling this up into a program, obviously there would be a little bit more buy-in from the customer point of view. Um, we initially started out having the contractors try and capture the enrollments and sign them up. And we found that that was because of the, the free nature of the pilot, that became a challenge. So we would definitely want to run that through more of a central location to be able to schedule installations, that kind of thing. All that said, the contractors themselves, the Trade Ally Network, was really excited about the technology and being able to promote it to their customers. Um, there were several, you know, we had uh, four contractors that were actually going out and actively doing the installations. And most of them were actually promoting the device for installation on any new hot water heaters that they were going out to install. So we definitely see the value in, in looping in the contractors and the Trade Ally Network if we're rolling this out as a larger program. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Jessica and, and uh, Rebecca, um, are you all leveraging uh, Trade Ally Networks and um, in this specific program? And, and uh, if, if, if not, um, then perhaps you can speak about your uh, experience with and um, viewpoints on leveraging those, those, uh, that ecosystem for scaling programs. Sure, Rebecca, you wanna go first or second? Uh, I'll second. Okay. <laughs> so right now in the program, we have uh, two electrician contractors, or sorry, three electrician contractors that we work with on a regular basis. Code dictates that um, you have to have an electrician do the installation if you're not installing in your own home in the PGE territory. And so for the most part at the moment, we are doing these retrofits and like leveraging all the momentum we built with recruiting directly with property managers and those relationships and working with um, from that professional organization I mentioned, Multifamily Northwest. Um, and I think moving forward, there is a desire to really capitalize on the new, new technologies coming out with the CTA 2045 ports on new electric water heaters. So uh, those don't have a lot of market penetration yet, but I think as you know, code changes come in the next couple of years and we start to see more of an opportunity to you know, kind of embrace that that market transformation towards CTA 2045, uh, there will be an opportunity to work with more trades like um, plumbers and contracted companies that are in, in new constructions, uh, things like that. So at the moment, um, we have three electricians and I think there's opportunity for more collaboration with the trades in the future. What do you think, Rebecca? Yeah, I, th I think you nailed it, uh, actually, uh, especially as we get into you know, CTA 2045, and hopefully after, you know, COVID when we really start ramping up. So, uh, yeah, you, you nailed it. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, Olin, are you all leveraging local uh, uh, trade allies or, or contractor networks, or is this all, are your installations and, and the recruitment, is that all being done uh, by Shifted? Oh, we use electricians. Now we just have a bunch of contractors. They're not hard to find. What's really nice is we can start with the list of approved contractors for solar water heating. And you know, those are people familiar with this industry. And oftentimes the work we do is good because they may not have solar installations to do. So yeah, we have not had any problems um, looking for uh, talented technicians. We've also went to the unions and found that there is a bunch of opportunities to, to get some lower cost deployments done with trainees, but we haven't used those um, services yet. 
Okay, great. I just want to oh, sorry, I want to take it back. Um, one thing you said, Owen, so when you said you have no problem finding contractors, we actually, like, there's so much construction happening in Portland right now that, like, we feel very lucky to have these ongoing relationships with just three electrician companies. Folks are so busy all the time here. So it's, it, right. I think it's interesting market to market how different that can be. Yeah. Well, you know, one note, though, Jessica, I have a caveat there. When we started, we had a terrible time finding technicians because the product we first developed required all these additional tools and apps and, you know, Wi-Fi. We took all sure. of that away, and that's what opened it up. So right now, um, oh. when you have a system that self-commissions where you plug and play, yeah. and it just connects up, then that's what I, I think is needed because otherwise you're, it's really hard to find electricians that are going to bring an app and set up a router and do all that stuff. It just adds cost as well, too. So our, our installs are about seven minutes per install, and you just plug it in and take off. Yeah, yeah I agree. Simplicity so that the trade ally can feel confident just walking away <laughs> really helps. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for those answers. So uh, Lisa Hecht uh, asked a couple of questions. Um, I'll answer one of them was, is anyone doing a DEE or EE pilot on heat pump water heaters or hybrids? Um, and the answer is uh, the ACEEE Hot Water Forum has a separate panel on, on this very topic. And uh, ACEEE has done, um, done some presentations and, and uh, um, I believe if you can search online uh, for them, you will be able to, uh, to, to, to dig those up. Uh, I also want to say that NRDC has done all kinds of studies and has some reports out on heat pump water heating, both on the EE side as well as on the um, demand response side. I would, so I would commend you to the NRDC's work on that. Uh, Lisa also asked about new standards for interconnection communication and control. Um, really the one that, that um, um, well, the, the one that uh, uh, Jessica mentioned, Jessica, perhaps you want to talk about CTA 2545 very briefly and maybe what it is and isn't. Ooh, see how I do. Um, so CTA 2045 is a standard that was developed uh, with EPRI in partnership with some uh, manufacturers and I think utility partners as well. And it is both a standardization of the port that is on the water heater. So my, a, a former uh, supervisor and mentor of mine used to like to call it the USB of water heater ports. So that way you can always plug in the device no matter what type of water heater you're using. And then it's also a set of uh, communication standards and commands basically. So like should shift um, so that you can also have consistency across the market. Uh, the connected water heater program isn't currently using any devices that use CTA 2045, but I think, so, I mean, all the water heater manufacturers are here. I'm sure you could ask them questions about <laughs> any plans they have. Um, so yeah, we're, we're looking forward to hopefully having a CTA 2045 device on the program at some point. It seems like it'll be important for, um, new products um, coming out in the coming years. Uh, but right now, our API integrations are uh, unique between Concerto and our vendors. How'd I do? Rebecca, what you want to add? <laughs> you I think you, it. I think you nailed it. Great job. <laughs> yeah, I think you nailed it. Again, the key thing is that uh, it's a uh, uh, both a physical um, kind of uh, layer as well as a uh, comms protocol, but it does need to be on uh, OEM, uh, on the water heater, or on a retrofit device okay. that uh, is installed on it. So um, it's not native, to, obviously, to the the, uh, the vast majority of the large of the water heater installed base. Um, right. right now. Can, right now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Ken, to you, um, there, there was a question around um, was what kind of hypothesis was there around uh, therm savings as well as to demand savings, and I, I can't recall whether you mentioned uh, uh, the, the, the numbers, but what was the kind of the uh, is there any hypothesis there? And um, uh, I know that we're still early, so we can't talk about the actual savings. But Lisa Heck asked about that, and so maybe you care to reiterate. What you have, uh, what you had said about that? 
Yeah, I think um, whether there was an actual number in mind, I don't think that there was at the time. I know that, you know, Quanta projects that there's some energy reduction in the usage on their website, and that's mainly the reason why we wanted to go out and do this pilot is determine what that level really was. Is it 10%, 15%? 30% on energy efficiency. Um, we are still going through the evaluation process, so none of those numbers, I know there's one question that said, what are the actual therm savings? Those numbers aren't actually publicly available yet, and they will be available in the report next year. Um, but I don't even have them in my possession personally to be able to you know, even mention anything. As far as the demand response, we did see about a 50% reduction in demand savings, but I don't know that the team collectively had a particular number in mind to work with at the beginning. I know the question says, you know, was there a hypothesis around annual significant therm savings? I, I'm not sure, I think that's kind of a, that's the tough part is was it significant savings how much was it going to be and i think that's where we were trying to go with the whole process so i'm not i'm I mean, not aware of specific about, numbers go ahead yeah i mean if you're talking about gas gas water heating you're talking about um you know somewhere between 175 and maybe 250 therms a year of usage depending on you are so and it's it's different uh, electric water heating is i believe somewhere in the range of like 2,500 to 3,000 kWh a year. So um, you can figure out what the uh, upper, uh, EE and the D opportunities from there. Um, so we're almost at time. I want to do kind of a one minute round for everybody. So everybody will get one minute um, uh, on this, my last question, which is, um, you know, uh, really interested to hear about how water heater control programs are sold internally. So namely to internal stakeholders or regulators. So uh, I know, Ken, you weren't involved with, um, you know, the actual uh, kind of uh, scoping and, or the, the selling, if you will, of this project, but uh, you've interacted with the Con Ed folks. So I'd be curious uh, for everybody. Um, and again, Ken, I'm going to put you on the spot, but then I'll go to Jessica and, and Rebecca and then Olin. Is, you know, what degree are... Um, you know, are internal safe stakeholders receptive to water heater control programs? How much education is needed about the unique role of water heaters? And uh, if there's, you know, competition, if you will, um, of water heater programs for other uh, demand side management uh, technologies and programs. So, Ken, maybe one minute for you, and then we'll go move on to your uh, other uh, panelists. Okay. So as far as other, the utilities interested in water heater programs, I think there is a little bit of an education process, but I do also think that everybody understands intuitively that water heating is pretty passive. Uh, you know, we put it in the basement and we forget about it. We don't even think about changing the temperature. We don't think about, you know, only thing we think about is if I don't have any hot water. So how do you get around that? How do you bring that to the fore? By being able to use these kind of units, it allows that to still kind of allows people to um, work with it without having to really bring it up as like a thermostat in your house in a particular zone. That said, it gives a customer a little bit more visibility and control over their hot water heater that they might not necessarily think of it. You know, I know people who say, I don't want to go into the basement, there's spiders down there. So uh, it gives folks a little bit more control by being able to use the online tools and now the new web app that's available so that they can actually uh, do some control with their hot water heater beyond what they thought about before. Excellent, thanks. So uh, Jess, Rebecca, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll let you go first, Rebecca. Um, Yep, absolutely. It's uh, it's been a great program at PGE. Um, it definitely took us uh, that first season. We had uh, a lot of jumps and bumps with it. Um, but it, as, as far as internally goes, um, you know, we, we get it. It's, it's a great program. It's super flexible. Um, we're able to kind of get them all online and just call them, you know, at will eventually uh, when it goes in-house. Um, and so we, we've had no issues, really. We're, we're really uh, have a positive outlook on it. We're excited to um, continue to grow it. And we're just now on the you know, early stages of um, going into single family um, and growing the product uh, or the program um, out of water heaters outside of uh, multifamily and the single family. So it's been, uh, it's been really great. 
Great, thanks. And, and Olin, Olin, maybe, or Jessica, maybe a couple of seconds from you, and then Olin will get, will get the last word real quick. I just wanted to, to add, in having been in a few of these conferences and these spaces, I think uh, PGE is in a somewhat like unique and awesome position in that their regulators are really enthusiastic about DR, and I think that's something I've noticed across the country differs a lot and so could potentially make the cell to get approved to move forward with the program harder, depending on like the regulatory environment you're in. And so just wanted to pop that on there and then say, totally echo what everyone else is saying, that water heaters are so flexible. It's amazing. You could you could do so many different things with them that that I think is such a, a key selling point. And on the PG Connected Water Heater Program, we don't actually notify residents when we call events because we're so confident in the safeguards that exist that you can, like what Ken was saying, super passive, like it's just there, it's just doing its thing. So there are a lot of awesome things about water heaters. Well, I hear a Nehruk uh, 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 WebEx uh, coming up here to, to get the o, uh, uh, OPCUP people on. Um, hey, uh, sorry, Olin, unfortunately, we're, we're at, uh, out of time here. Um, so I'm getting the, the red sorry, flag Olin. from uh, the ACEEE people. Um, but listen, thank you all so much for participating. I believe we had, uh, uh, you know, three 300 plus people on the line. So really excited about that. Please do join us. Um, well, one, again, on the Shameless uh, Commerce session at 3.30. Um, and then also please uh, join it or continue the conversation on the uh, Zoom platform. Um, which uh, I believe the uh, button should be there at the bottom of the screen. So uh, the, the panel participants will all be going into the Zoom platform right now. So thank you all for your time. Thank you to our sponsors again. Thank you to ACEEE for setting this up. Take care, everyone. <laughs>